What a blessing. Well, this weekend, I want to share with you a... I'm going to tell you the topic, and some of you will think, oh, this, but you know what? This is what you need. So... Um, don't, re- don't reject this just because you think, oh, I've heard this before. But I want to talk to you about just knowing God, what it means to know God. We're going to be spending a couple of times just talking about how important it is to know God, not just to receive something from God, but to know Him. Everything really comes out of knowing Him. Not only everything that God gives, but did you know your stability your peace, your joy, everything in the Christian life really comes from relationship. You could ask any of our Bible college students, and we put different titles on all of our classes, but it's all about knowing Him. Amen. I know my second year class, I've got a a teaching about longevity in ministry and how to last a long time in ministry. And the number one thing is have a close, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. And basically, I spend the whole class teaching on that. And then we give other steps that you can add to it. But you know what? That really is what it comes down to. If you know the Lord, God will sustain you supernaturally. If you know the Lord, He'll teach you what you need to know to be able to receive. And out of the people that I minister to, I would say that the vast majority of people do not know God in a working way, and that really is at the heart of all of the problems. And at a meeting like this, I would suspect that there is a large number of people that you believe God can perform miracles, you believe that God can touch your life, and you came here wanting to receive, and maybe you're looking to me or someone else to be able to help you receive But you know what? You don't really know God. It's like, uh, in a sense, you are wanting us to take what we know and be able to deliver it to you. But one of the distinguishing characteristics of true Christianity is that we no longer have a priest that stands in between us and God and that is a go-between. Not an Old Testament priest or in the New Testament. We don't have to have somebody with their collar turned around backwards to stand in between us and God and pray for us and tell us what God's will is. But there is the priesthood of the believer. Every one of us now have direct access to God and every one of us ought to have an intimate, close, personal relationship with God. And yet it isn't so. It isn't so with most people, and that's not the way that it's supposed to be. So one of the things that I would love to accomplish this weekend is to talk about how important this is, to present it as something that is not just for the super saint, for the full-time minister, but for every Joe Blow or Jane Doe Christian. You are supposed to know God personally. You are supposed to have God be able to touch your life and relate to Him. It ought to be that God is your best friend. This isn't just for a few people. And you know, again, I'm still giving an introduction here, but let me just say that I think that this is one of the things that's not functioning well in the body of Christ. We have this mentality of super saints, people that have special anointings on their life, and we have people running all over the country trying to get a special touch from somebody else. And even though there are people that have special gifts, that is not meant to be the norm. That ought to be an exception. It ought to be an abnormality. It ought to be that every one of us, you know, if you hear about God doing something in a special place, well, you want to go just so that you can be blessed or to be a part of it, but you aren't desperate. You aren't having to go and and with your tongue hanging out seeking for a blessing from God. The Bible says that these blessings will overcome you will o- overtake you. They will come... Let's see, how does it say that? Deuteronomy 28. They will come upon you and overtake you. In other words, they're going to chase you down, I heard somebody say. You know, instead of us having to chase after the blessings of God, if you knew God, God loves you so much. God is such a good God. He's wanting to move in your life that it ought to be that you just can't get away from it. Everywhere you turn, you're blessed. And yet this is not the attitude of the average Christian. The average Christian is pursuing God with the mindset that God is somewhat hostile towards them or indifferent towards them, and they are looking for some step that they can use to manipulate and make God release His power. 
I tell you, you don't know God if that's the attitude that you've got. God is not far from any of us. The truth is God is seeking you out. God is hunting you out. God is looking for ways to bless you. But it's our own insensitivity to Him that really blocks Him from doing things. Everything in the Christian life really comes out of knowing God. Let me just share some scriptures. Let's turn over, first of all, to John chapter 8. And let me show you a difference between believing on the Lord and knowing God. In John chapter 8, I'm not going to take time to read the entire passage, but Jesus, of course, was uh, in a familiar situation where all the scribes and the Pharisees were criticizing him and saying, well, who gave you the right to do this? And what authority do you have to challenge all of our religious systems and say that we're wrong? And they were criticizing him and he was defending his right to do this, saying that he knew God and that he was truly representing God. And um, so this is in John chapter 8. And um, in verse 25 it says, Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, this is talking about when he was crucified. The same thing was said in John chapter 12. And there it, in the next verse it says specifically he was speaking of his crucifixion. So he's talking about when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he. Notice that the word he is italicized. That means he says, then you will know that I am. I am is the name that God revealed himself to Moses uh, at. He was saying here, you will know that I am and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that um, sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Now think about this. It says many believed on him. Believed what? Believed that he was the one to come, that he was the Christ, that he was the I am. The same things that he'd been saying throughout this entire chapter. This is saying that many of the people heard Jesus and believed on him. And look what he said to them in verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Did you know that there's a difference between believing on Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus? If words mean anything, that's what this says right here. They believed on him, and Jesus said to those that believed, If you continue in my word, then are you a disciple Indeed, the word disciple means a learner or follower. If you continue in my word, then you are truly a disciple. And in verse 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Notice that you can believe on Jesus and really not be free. You have to continue in the word and become a disciple And then when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. The truth doesn't just set you free. People will quote this all of the time. But it's the truth you know that sets you free. It's the truth that is working in your life. We have multitudes of people today that have believed on Jesus as their Savior. And they have confessed that. And I believe that they're born again. If something was to happen and if they were to die, they would go to be with the Lord in heaven. But they haven't continued on and become a disciple. They don't know the truth. And they aren't free. And of course, you could define the truth in a number of different ways. The Bible says in John 17, verse 17, Jesus was speaking and he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. But the word of God is how God reveals Himself to us. Jesus also said this in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So you could say this in John chapter 8, verse 32, And you shall know Me, 
or you shall know me through the revelation that I give of the word, and then you will be free. The truth you know. When you get to know me, you will be free. You know, like I said in the beginning, this is hard for me to say because people think, oh, I know God. But there is, there's height, there's depth, there's length, there's breadth, there's degrees of knowing God. You know, there's some of you that say you know me. And you know me because you've seen me on television. You could recognize me. If you saw me someplace, you would say, oh, I know him. That doesn't mean that you know me because you recognize what I look like. I have people come up all the time and say, oh, I know you because I've listened to so many of your teachings. I know your stories. And Well, you know, uh, seeing what goes on in my life and hearing me relate things, you know me better the more you know about me. But there's still a difference in knowing uh, some things that I've done and knowing, you know, where I grew up and things, knowing things about me and knowing me. You know, when you really know a person, you can basically predict what they're going to do. You know, I know Jamie in the scriptural sense of the word. I know Jamie. And if you were to come to me and if you were to say, well, Jamie said this about you and Jamie did this, you know what? You would just be barking up the wrong tree because I know her. I know what she will do. And I know the things that she would say about me. I know what she would do. When you really know a person, you can't be deceived about what that person would do. And yet, this is one of, I believe, one of the big problems in the body of Christ. There's so many doctrines out there. And some people are saying God's the one that puts sickness and disease in your life. God is the one who won't answer your prayer. God may put some cancer on you because you haven't been studying the Word or praying or you haven't surrendered to the ministry and it's God's judgment on you and God's trying to break you. And you know, people, the only people who will accept something like that are people that don't know God. If you know God, God is 100% good. The scripture says over in James chapter 1, I believe it's verse 12, verse 14. I think it's probably verse 14. It says, don't let any man say when he is tempted that he is tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempts he any man. God is not the author. It says, every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness. That means it never changes or shadow of turning. God never deviates from this. God gives only good and perfect gifts. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came to give us an abundant life. And yet there are people today who are afraid that God is not going to answer their prayer because they haven't lived holy enough. They're afraid that God is actually punishing them. They embrace sickness and disease and poverty and hurt and heartache as being God's judgment on them. And I'm telling you that that is an indication that you don't know God. Thank you for both of those amens. <laughs> you know, I had a, a man come to one of my meetings one time, and he had a 12-year-old daughter that was in a wheelchair. The girl was quadriplegic. Her mind didn't work. She was a vegetable They had to put diapers on her, and uh, she was in terrible shape. And I was saying some things along these lines. He got so mad that he left. And the people who brought him to the meeting says, why don't you stay until after the meetings and talk to him? Maybe he misunderstood him. Maybe he can explain himself. And so they had him stay around. So he, he stayed around, and I was talking to him. His daughter was in this wheelchair. I was standing here, and he was standing behind the wheelchair, and I was talking to him, and this man was mad. And he says, you're saying that God didn't make my daughter this way. He says, she was born this way. This is God's will. She's glorifying God. Nothing can happen but what God allows it. God is the one who made her this way. And I understand why people say that, because you know what? It's a defense mechanism. Rather than us admitting that things happen that are not God's will and that sometimes we miss it, sometimes it's just the fact that we live in a fallen world 
or all of these other things. It's easier just to say, well, God must have willed it. And so we take some kind of comfort in the fact that God must somehow or another be getting glory out of this. But man, the scripture teaches that there's lots of things that happen that are not God's will. For instance, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is not God's will for a single person to die and go to hell, and yet multitudes of people are dying and going to hell, and it is not God's will. It's because God gave us a free choice, and we have the ability to choose. And some people are in out-and-out rebellion and denial towards God. Other people just ignore it. Other people have never heard the truth or they've been lied to and deceived by religion into thinking that it's their own good works instead of putting faith in a Savior. But there's a lot of people outside of God's perfect will, which is salvation. God's will does not automatically come to pass. So I began to start telling this guy, I said, it's not God's will for your daughter to be like this. God loves her. God wants her to be well. And I started sharing Scripture with him. Well, he came back at me with Scripture, and he started countering me, and he says, how dare you say this? And this guy was really mad at me because I was taken away the way he had coped. He thought, well, it must be God's will. And that's the way that he had coped with his daughter being like this for all of those years. And I was saying, no, it's not God's will. And he got mad. And he was quoting scriptures back at me that I thought he was misusing. So I would counter him and he thought I was misusing him. So we were going back and forth. And this guy, we were getting nowhere. And this guy was really ticked at me. Very upset. I thought I got nothing to lose. So I just looked at him and I said, what kind of father are you that doesn't even care about whether or not his daughter's in a wheelchair? What kind of man are you that wants his daughter to be a vegetable and never do anything normal? What kind of man are you? Boy, this guy, he was already mad. He was, he was really mad. He got really mad. And I mean, he screamed at me and he said, how dare you? He says, I'd do anything. I would pay any amount of money. It doesn't matter how much it cost. He says, I would mortgage my life if I had to. He says, if I could, I would take her place and I would be a quadriplegic so that she could be normal like me. And he says, how dare you say that about me? And I turned around and I said, and you think God Almighty loves your daughter less than you? Now, see, he could argue doctrine and theological points, but when it comes right down to it, do you think that any father would see his daughter in a vegetative state and sit there and will that and say it's, you know, or let's say that, the, you know, some kid didn't read their Bible. They didn't rehearse their verses the way that they should. And so you strike them with cancer to teach them a lesson and to humble them. Do you know any parents that treat their kids that way? If you do, I guarantee you, we got agencies that would take those kids away from them. That's child abuse. There isn't a civilized nation on the face of the earth that would embrace something like that. And yet, this is what religion is representing God as. And saying God is the one that causes all these things. God's the one that's causing these wars. God's the one that's doing all of these things. There's people saying God caused the terrorist attacks. I remember September the 11th. This really upset me because all of the leading religious figures in the United States came on television and started saying, well, this is because we've taken prayer out of the schools. This is because we haven't been seeking God. This is God's judgment. They were placing God as the source of these terrorist attacks, killing people and doing all of this. That's wrong. That is not God. God is not judging this nation. I got a few amens down here. I'm going to just go down there and preach to you guys. Some of y'all are saying, well, well, I hear this all of the time. Man, God's going to judge us. See, you don't know God. Again, if you, no parent would treat his children the way that we are being told that God treats us. If you just understood that God is love, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, or verse 8 or 9, right there. God is love. It doesn't say that He has love. It's not just one of the characteristics. That is who God is. God is love. You know, when I had my experience with the Lord, March the 23rd, 1968, 
I'm going to, I'm going to teach from this and share some things later in this series this weekend. But one of the things that happened was I came to realize that I was trying to relate to God based on my own goodness. And all of a sudden, God just pulled back the curtains and showed me that, man, I didn't have any goodness. Showed me I was an absolute hypocrite. And, man, I repented in sackcloth and ashes. And then, at my very worst, when I'd finally realized how bad I was, God's love just came pouring through my life. For four and a half months, I was gone someplace, caught up in the presence of God. And it was wonderful, but instantly I knew that God's love was not based on any goodness in my life. I didn't have any goodness. I knew that God loved me independent of who I was, and I knew that God was 100% good. Did you know instantly my theology began to change because I came to know God? And I'm just saying, brothers and sisters, that you, this may not be a message that most of, it, most of us would sit here and say, oh yeah, I know God. But if we really knew Him, the way that Jesus is talking about, that we continue in His truth, and then that truth will make us a disciple indeed. And when we know the truth, we will be set free. You could say it this way. Look at the end of this verse. It says, knowing the truth will make you free. Are you free? Are you free from sickness? Are you free from depression? Are you free from fear? Are you free from bitterness? Are you free from criticism? Are you free from the hopelessness that this world operates in? If you aren't walking in freedom in any of these areas, then I can guarantee you just backtrack. This is what makes you free is knowing the truth. If we aren't free in any area of our life, then somehow or another, it's because we don't know Him the way that we're supposed to know Him. Look over in Ephesians chapter 3. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And in Ephesians chapter 3, he begins to pray a prayer in verse 14. And he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might, by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you be rooted and grounded in love. Remember that God is love. And as you get rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. In other words, this isn't a one-dimensional thing. There is dimension. There is depth. There's, there's different levels of understanding and knowing God. But he wants us to be able to comprehend the breadth, length, depth, and height. And in verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that we might be filled with all of the fullness of God. That verse says that he wants you to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Now, if it passes knowledge, how can you know it? It's because it's talking about two different types of knowledge. A Western mentality, our mentality is basically we go to school and we learn some facts and pass the test and we say, oh, I know that. But you know, in the Eastern mentality, the language that the Bible was written in, it's talking about an experiential type of knowledge. For instance, it says that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore a child. The word know is used in the Hebrew to describe the intimate relationship between a man and his wife that results in a child being born. It's talking about an experiential, an intimacy with God. And so what this is saying is that you would experience Christ experientially, that you would come to know Him in an intimate, close, personal way, and then you will be filled with all of the fullness of God. Turn this verse around and look at the results. The results is being filled with all the fullness of God. Is there anybody in here who isn't filled with all of the fullness of God? Is there anybody in here? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Is there anybody in here who's saying, man, I know that there's more. I'm hungry. You know, I get in trouble. I get in trouble all of the time with this. But I go to churches where they sing, I'm desperate for you. 
And they call it desperation conferences and desperation ban. You know, the word desperation means without hope. Desperation is a terrible word. And it ought to have nothing to do with a believer. Matter of fact, I was in a church and they were up singing, I'm hungry for you, I'm desperate for you. And they were just wailing and travailing, oh God, come and oh God, move. And I got up and I said, how many of you are hungry for God? And everybody, the pastor stood up leading the pack, I'm hungry for God. And I said, let's turn over to John chapter 6. And uh, let me just read this to you in John chapter 6. I believe it's around verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I said, if you're hungry and thirsty, why don't you get saved? Why don't you get born again? (laughs) Amen. And he just put them all back on their heels. But you know what? You may not be totally normal. You know, coming out on a Thursday night to hear a hick from Texas, it's debatable about whether you're normal or not. (laughs) But if this is a typical group, I bet you 90% of you just at times, oh God, please come and touch me. Oh God, please. You say, you know, we often get up and say, how many of you know that there's something more that you aren't experiencing everything that's got? And you know what? 99% of the people will raise their hands. The average Christian is hungry, desperate, crying out the opposite of what Jesus said, that if you know Him, which passes knowledge, you will be filled with all the fullness of God. Brothers and sisters, we don't have to go through our life hungry. People say, but I think it's good to be hungry. Well, it's to me, it's like a person sitting in front of a ten-course meal. And they're talking about how hungry they are. I say, if you're hungry, eat. You got all of this right in front of you. Quit talking about it. Quit belly aching. Quit singing songs about feed me, feed me, and eat. (laughs) Jesus has already provided everything. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in us bodily, and I've been sharing these scriptures, if we would just know Him, if we would just take advantage of what God's given us, you ought to be full to the max. The Bible says, in the presence of the Lord, Psalm 1611, in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. Well, the Lord said He would never leave us nor forsake us. So we're always in the presence of the Lord. Why aren't we having fullness of joy? See, it's here, it's available, but the truth is most of us are occupied and more dominated by other things. We aren't drawing on what God has given us. And so what we do is come up with songs and prayers and we plead as if it's God's fault. God has set this table. God has placed His fullness on the inside of us. God has given you everything that it takes. And again, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I am not scolding you. I'm trying to help you. But there are people here that have come to me thinking that I'm going to get you healed. I'm going to do this. And you are coming and wanting me to do everything for you. And again, I'm here. I want to be a blessing to you. But brothers and sisters, you don't have to come running to me. God lives on the inside of you. God wants to minister to you. And there are many of you just thinking, oh no, I've got to have you do it. You know, if you saw our healing series that I did on television recently, I uh, taught a lot on all of this. And we have that Healing Journeys, Volume 1, where we have five testimonies. And one of the things that I like about that Healing Journeys is because it doesn't portray me as being the person with the great gift of healing. Even though I was involved in every one of those healings, if you really paid attention to it, like, for instance, Jason Peterson, the boy that had the eczema so bad for a year. And I mean, I even told Damon one time, I said, I'm sure glad that you took pictures, but I'm surprised that you did. It looked so bad. I'm surprised that you took pictures and documented all of this. And he said, we didn't take pictures on the bad days. 
He says, we only had pictures of the really good days. And it looked pretty bad. But I prayed with Jason a couple of times. I did everything I knew, and I spoke the word over him. And you know what? They had to walk this out. And finally, the Lord gave him a word of knowledge about Jason's heart. And when he prayed over his heart, boom, like that, within one week, he cleared up. Shirley Vaughn, who had this eating disorder, I prayed with her, and instantly she felt good for the first time in years. She went out and ate and was wonderful, and everything was good for about 24 hours. But the next morning when she woke up, all of that came back with a vengeance. And Cecil Paxton went and explained to him that, you know what, your body was healed. That's the reason you felt better. But in your heart, you still saw yourself sick. Now you've got to change your heart. It's not a matter of healing. It's a heart issue. And she decided to stand, and it took about 48 hours. But, man, they were able to see a miraculous healing. Uh, this little girl, Hannah, that was healed over in England, man, the parents got hold of the Word, and I prayed, and instantly they believed that she was healed. And for the first time in her life, three and a half years old, she ate food, solid food, and swallowed for the first time in her life. And it, it was good, but within two hours... She started to throw up again. But they took the word and they spoke and did it. And I can guarantee you, I, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people I've prayed with that have seen instantaneous results. I prayed with two or three people today. I met a, a lady, Sharon, in the um, elevators today. And it's a long story, but she got healed. She had pain, chronic pain, and the pain was instantly gone and all of these things. Right here, right? How are you doing tonight? Great. She's had chronic pain and all the pain's gone. But you know what? Satan comes to steal away the Word. And I was trying to tell Sharon, I said, if you ever have another pain, it doesn't mean that you weren't healed. It just means that it's Satan trying to get an inroad. It's like a knock on the door. And it depends if you say, no, in the name of Jesus, I was healed and the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And if you take your authority and stand on it, then you're healed. But if you have another pain come and you think, oh, no, it didn't work or, oh, no, I lost it. Then you just allow it back in. And see, what I'm trying to say is praise God for people that have special anointings for healing and for things like that. I'm not denying that those things exist. I don't have any of those anointings. I'm Joe Blow believer. My anointing is to teach the Word of God. I do not have a special anointing for healing. And yet I've seen the blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've seen miracles upon miracles. Praise God for people that have special anointings, but I would love to see every member of the body of Christ get to where they know God and to where they knew Him in a real experiential way so that they could know that, God, You've healed me. And I don't have to... I don't care what it feels like. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what anybody says. I know what God has done. And man, if you can reach that place... If you can reach the place to where you know God, then you know what? You don't have to wait until I come to town or until the next minister comes to town. Jesus will go home with you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. Everything that God is, if you are born again, everything that God is is already on the inside of you. And if you aren't experiencing the fullness of God in you, it's because you just don't experientially know what has already been given to you. Boy, that's powerful. And again, this is different than a lot of people think. See, a lot of people think that, well, no, I just don't have what these people have. I don't have this. They hear somebody else's testimony and they think, oh, I wished I had that. You do. You've already got the same faith that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you. And somebody says, well, no, I don't have any faith. Yes, you do. If you've been born again, you've got the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, how many Christians spend time saying, Oh God, give me more faith. Oh God, increase my faith. How many times do we spend time praying, Oh God, come and be with us? What a stupid prayer. <laughs> stupid prayer. Somebody said, Well, what's wrong with that? He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And so why do we pray and ask God to come and be with us? If he said, I'll never leave you. 
It's because either we don't believe or we're ignorant of what the Word of God says. But the truth is, God's already here. We'll say things like, well, boy, that prayer didn't get above the ceiling. You don't need your prayer to get above your nose. That's the reason you bow your head when you pray, so you can look at God. You say, Father, amen. God lives right here in your belly. Brothers and sisters, we got all of these things. We just don't know what we have. What I want to accomplish this weekend is to introduce you to what you have and to show you ways to understand and discover what you already have in Christ. Just trying to get you to know what God has already done on the inside of you. And I tell you, if if we could do that, you know, it's, it's the difference between taking a golden egg and taking the goose that laid the golden egg home with you, amen? You don't need an egg. You don't need a touch. You don't need me to do something for you. What you need to do is come to realize who is already on the inside of you and come to know Him. I can't go home with you, but Jesus will go with you and He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you all of the time. Look over here in Philippians chapter 3. This is the Apostle Paul speaking again. And in Philippians chapter 3... In verse 3, he says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. You know, I don't have time to put all of this in its proper context, but Paul was saying radical things. He was speaking to Gentiles right here. The Philippians were Gentiles. Now, there were some Jews scattered among them, but the vast majority of the Philippian church were Gentiles, and he says, We are the circumcision. Did you know the Jews, this would have literally incensed them to include a Gentile among the people of God and call them the circumcision? How dare you do that? You know, this incensed a lot of, um, uh, what do we call them today? Messianic Jews. There's a lot of people that really get incensed over this. They're trying to put... Christianity back into the Messianic mold and, and back into the Jewish things. There's, there's a lot that we can learn from the Jews and from our Jewish roots. I'm not saying that, but I'm telling you, if you think this is offensive to Messianic Jews, what I'm saying right here, this is one of the reasons that they killed Paul. They came against him and did all of this. This was a radical statement. You are the circumcision. And then he says in verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he he may trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. He didn't say sinless, but blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Verse 8, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Again, this word knowledge here isn't talking about just intellectual information. Paul was talking about he's, he gave up everything. He lost it. He was at one time the most educated man, the most... He was the most influential. He was the rising star among the Jews. He was on his way to a position of influence. He had all of these things going for him, and he lost it all for Jesus. And he says, I count everything but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. What a word picture. There's not very many of us that have this same attitude as the Apostle Paul. We take tremendous amount of pride. We brag in our accomplishments. You know what we do with our accomplishments? We frame them and stick them on the wall. Paul said that's done. You know, I taught on this in school one time, and my class brought me a cow patty (laughs) and put it on a piece of wood and framed it and said something about Bush University. And I hung that up for a while. Jamie got it and threw it away. (laughs) 
She didn't like that, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> Most people put all of their degrees on the wall and brag about it. Paul said it's like dumb. That's, a, that's quite a statement. You know, I'm always amused at these people. Like, for instance, if you go to school and earn a doctorate, that's one thing. But I'm always amused at these preachers that get an honorary doctorate. And then they go around and everybody's doctor this and doctor that and bishop this and the most right reverend, all of these things. When the Lord told us to call no man on the earth your master or your father, and yet we father this and right reverend and bishop that. And we put a lot of stock in all of our accomplishments. Paul said it's just done. Oh, those are strong statements. And in verse 9, he, there, here's what he did. He counted everything but done so that he might win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I believe that this is a progression. He gave up all of this stuff so that he might know Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings. I mean, and the power of his resurrection and then the fellowship of his sufferings and then being made conformable unto his death. Most people are missing the knowing him. And we want to go right to the resurrection power. We want to see the healing power of God. We want God to touch us. And even though God loves us and God touches people, you certainly don't have to be a spiritual giant to receive a miracle from God. That's not what I'm saying. But in a sense, it's a shame to get your body healed and leave here and then not know God. If you had to choose between the two, knowing God ought to be much more important than getting healed. Knowing God, having a relationship with God, not to where you know about Him, but that you know Him. You know what He's going to do. You've experienced Him. That's much more important than getting healed, than getting blessed, than getting delivered. Amen. And brothers and sisters, there's not very many people with that attitude. There's most people that they, the only reason they even take time out of their uh, television schedule is so that they can come and get something so that they can go back to watching their television without having pain. It's so that we can do things and go back to our carnal lifestyle. And again, in a sense, I'm preaching to the choir because here we are on Thursday night and you're the fanatics. But you know what? Still, there's a lot of people in here that the truth is we're more excited about what God can do for us than we are about knowing Him. And yet, this is what it's all about. Christianity differs from every other religion in a number of ways. We're the only religion that has a Savior. All other religions place the burden of salvation on your back. But another major difference between true Christianity and other religions is that we actually have fellowship with Him. We have relationship. Other people don't have a relationship. They've got a set of rules and doctrines. And they've got creeds. And they get dogmatic. And they do all of these things. They're harsh. They're judgmental. But true Christianity is a relationship with a person. And you know what? If you're in relationship with Him, then all of this fullness will be flowing. If you're in relationship, there will be fullness of joy at His right hand, pleasures forevermore. There will be joy and peace. There are symptoms that go along with having a relationship. When you're really in relationship with God, you don't worry about stuff because you know the one that controls everything and you know He's so good that it's going to all work out. God will take care of it. And yet there's so many Christians that are panicking exactly the same as non-believers. There's so many Christians that are worried. You know, when you know God, you don't fall prey to all of the lies and the deception that are going on. You know, they're talking about recession and they're talking about how bad everything is and the gas prices has gone up. 
You know what? When you know God, everything is all relative. It doesn't matter. God's going to supply my need according to His riches and glory. I just had some of my directors from the UK over here, and they were with me in Florida, and they were just thrilled at how cheap the gas is. They are paying $14 a gallon for diesel in England. And they were talking about it's so cheap over here. And they were thrilled. And they were thrilled with how cheap the food is. It's about one-third the price of food in the U.K. And they are just thrilled. They are praising God for the things that you're griping about. Am I saying that we don't try and do something? No, there's, I don't like these high prices, but I'm saying that we get worried over stuff. If you know God, God said He's going to supply your need. And it wouldn't matter if, if gasoline was $14 a gallon. God said He'd supply your needs. It's not coming out of your pocket. It's coming out of God's pocket. He's the one that's going to supply your need. Why are you worried about it? Amen? While everybody else is panicking, Christians ought to be seeing this as a great opportunity. People are going to start dumping things for just pennies on the dollar. This is a great opportunity for us to buy. Amen? You know what? If you know God, you have a different attitude about things. You don't get worried. People say, but look at our political process. We're in an election year and there's all this stuff and everybody's saying what's wrong with the United States and criticizing everything. Think about the Apostle Paul. He lived in a government system where the the Caesar proclaimed himself as God and wanted people to worship him as God. Slavery was the rule of the day. There was injustices. There was things that make our situation look wonderful in comparison. And yet Paul didn't gripe and complain about it. He said, bless those, pray for those people. And he never formed a revolt or rebellion. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, many of us, if you were to take you and put you right beside your unsaved neighbor and listen to your talk and their talk, you'd be griping just as much as they're griping. You'd be just as fearful as they're fearful. You'd be just as worried. You'd be just as sick. You'd be just as poor. Something's wrong with this picture. We got the life of God living on the inside of us. We've been born again. We should never hunger. We should never thirst. We should be optimistic, and yet we aren't. You know why? Because we we have come to know Him as Savior. We think about eternity, and we want to receive forgiveness so that we don't go to hell. But in this life, we don't know Him. We aren't spending time. We don't know Him in an intimate, close, personal way, and we're missing out on the real purpose of salvation. We need to know Him. And then, out of that comes the power of His resurrection and all of the other things. I'm telling you, your your desire tonight ought to be to know God more than to be healed, more than to be set free, more than to have something else. You know the truth, and then that sets you free. Amen? Look over in Jeremiah chapter 9 at this passage. Again, I wish I had time to put all of this in its proper context, but if you read Jeremiah chapter 9, this is written to the Jews who had rebelled at God and God was bringing judgment upon them and they were going to be led into captivity. It's talking about all of this. And the people, the, one of the main themes of this chapter is that the people were full of lies and deceit. They loved lying and they loved deception and they loved treachery. Did you know that that's uh, descriptive of our society? Boy, there's a lot of lying. You know how you can tell if a politician's lying? You look them square in the face and if their lips are moving, they're lying. Amen. <laughs> We've just about become, you know, used to politicians saying one thing and then meaning another and saying, well, it defend, depends on what the definition of is is. And... You know, even if you have it written down in a contract, if you got a good lawyer, it doesn't mean anything. Look at verse 6. It says, 
Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. We're talking about knowing God. Did you know if you love deceit, if we would have kept on reading in John chapter 8, those people begin to rebel at Jesus saying, you'll be made free. And they said, what do you mean we'll be made free? We've never been in bondage to any man. That's, you know, that's an arrogant statement because they were the Jews that were being oppressed by the Romans. They were an occupied nation. And yet they were so proud they wouldn't admit that they were oppressed by any man. They were, they were in bondage. They admit they were a conquered nation. And yet they, they took offense. We've never been in bondage to any man. And Jesus said to whoever overcomes you, whoever you yield yourself to, that's who you're in bondage to. You, you're yielded to sin. Therefore, sin is your master. And they said, no, there's nothing wrong with us. And he finally said in verse 44, you are of your father the devil. And he says he's a father of all, he's a liar from the beginning and he's the father of all lies. Did you know that Satan is the one that originates all of these half-truths and people not speaking the truth and not having integrity? And our society today is characterized by a lack of integrity, by people manipulating, lying, not keeping their word. They promise you this, they default on their product. You know what? Satan is the author of all of that. And it says that when, if you are into deceit, unless you are a person that will swear to their own hurt and change not, but you are going to hold your word regardless of what, then you know what? You cannot know God and be a person of lies and deception and deceit. That's what this is saying. That's a pretty strong statement. In verse 23, look at this. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth or boast, glory or boast in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Oh, what a powerful passage. Let me just ask you, I don't want you to raise your hand on this. But how many of us have boasted in our wisdom, in your education, in your abilities? How many of us have boasted in your might, which just means power and ability? How many of us boast in all of the things? Man, all of the things that we've accomplished, and we take a lot of satisfaction and accomplishment in all of this. How many of us boast in our riches? How many of you buy a car so that people can see that, man, you have arrived? It's a statement about you. How many of you buy a house and you want everybody to come over and see your nice house? And we are boasting and reveling in all of our accomplishments. Totally opposite. What God says. It's not saying that you can't have those. But that's not what you should be boasting in. It says, let him that boast or glory, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That's what, that's what life is all about, is about knowing God. That's what God created you for. God created you so that he could have relationship with you. And we've gotten so far away from that. We're looking for houses and cars and accomplishments and the praises of men. And we're looking for all of these other things. And most people are sitting there saying, oh, God, I'm hungry, I'm desperate. And they wonder why. It's because they aren't reveling or boasting in knowing God. If you were to make God the focus of your life, if you wanted to know Him more than you know anybody else, And if knowing God is the thing that made you tick, I guarantee you, when you know God, everything that God is and has just begins to start flowing in your life. And it happens nearly automatically. You know, there's a song that I heard sung, and it's it's powerful, and it says, just about the time I feel like I've been caught in the mire of self, Just the time I feel my mind's been bought by worldly wealth. That's when the breeze begins to blow. I know the Spirit's call. And all of these worldly things just pass away. And then he starts off singing, Oh, I want to know you more. God, I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you. And I would give my final breath 
to know you in your death and resurrection. And you know, that's about what it takes. A good friend of mine, Bob Nichols, always, he says this, and I apply it to everything. That as long as you can live without knowing God, you will. But when you get to a place to where you can't live without knowing God, then you'll begin to know Him. Look at this passage in Jeremiah chapter 11. We're real close right here. Or, let's see, that's not right. 29.11. That's why I thought 11. Jeremiah 29.11. says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. And if you were to take this in His context, you know what this is talking about? He's talking about judgment. He says that there are going to be people enter your land. They're going to overrun you. They're going to destroy your cities. They're going to burn your houses. They're going to take your women and rape them and, and cut the babies out of them. And there's going to be terrible tragedy and all of this. And right in the midst of this pronunciation of judgment, God says, But I know my thoughts towards you. I know that this is my plan. He says, how did this come to pass? It came to pass because you wouldn't follow me. You wouldn't let me release my life. It's because you have chosen your own way is the reason this has happened. But here's my thoughts towards you, says the Lord. In verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Notice it says, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search with all of your heart. The reason more of us haven't really discovered the Lord is because... It's not our something we're doing with all of our heart. We can live without knowing Him. We've got all of these other things that occupy us. And again, I praise God for America. You know, I've been to a lot of different countries, and I just praise God for the good things that He's done in this country. But in many ways, our prosperity, our blessings, keep us from being dependent upon the Lord. You go to some of these third world countries and you know what? Those people there, if God doesn't do a miracle, they don't have a welfare system that's going to bail them out. They don't have all of the handicapped access that is going to allow them to function and still get around and do things. I mean, if God doesn't come through, they're going to die. They're miserable. They are living a substandard life. And so they have to recognize their need for God. They, they are more prone to seek God than many of us are. But prosperity has lulled us into complacency. And we can go home and we can dull the pain that's on the inside by watching something and filling ourselves with all of the stuff that the world has to offer and so we just don't recognize it. But I'm telling you that that desire, feeling that there's something more, it's not more television, it's not more movies, it's not more success, it's not more money, it's not more of anything but Jesus. This is, this is what it's all about. Knowing God. God created us for a relationship with Him. That's the purpose of your creation. And if you aren't experiencing an intimate, close, personal relationship with Jesus, you are missing the whole purpose of salvation. I'm going to explain this more in the morning. I can't go into all of that tonight. But I tell you, that's what it's about. And there's so many people that they know God exists. They believe that He can do things, just like we read in John chapter 8. They believe on Him, but they haven't continued in the Word. They haven't become disciples. They don't know Him. They don't know the truth. And that's the reason that they haven't been made free. And the good thing about all of this, I'm not holding up a standard here and, and just saying, you know, you've got to strive to get it. God wants you to know Him more than you want to know Him. Let me share one last passage with you out of the book of Revelation, chapter 4. This will be the last passage tonight, maybe. <laughs> Revelation, chapter 4. This tells you what's going on in heaven right now. Around the throne, there's the 24 elders, there's the four living creatures, and they're just constantly worshiping God day and night. And here's what they say in verse 10. It says, The four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne and worship Him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before 
the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Now this is really important the way it's stated. It says that the original purpose of God creating everything, which includes us, the original purpose and still the purpose is for His pleasure. God created us for pleasure. He didn't create us just for service. Often you'll hear this emphasized and people say, do a work for God and you got to do something. And people think that if I'll just become a human doing instead of a human being, that somehow or another God will be pleased with me. And so we put so much effort into all of these things. But God loves you more than He loves what you can do for Him. God loves you more than the service that you can render to Him. God created mankind for His pleasure so that we could just have a relationship with Him. God Almighty, who created the heavens and the earth and had a universe to run, came and met with Adam and Eve every evening in the cool of the evening and talked with them. Think about that. You know, God Almighty, right now there's six point something billion people on the face of the earth. Every one of them at some time or another calls out to God. He's busy. Got plenty of things to do. And yet God will never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you every moment of every day. You know, recently we've been taking care of my granddaughter a lot. And... uh, I have just really enjoyed watching her just play with grass or play with a butterfly or just do something that is makes no sense. She's not contributing anything to society. She's not making a difference. She's just doing nothing. And you know what? I just look at her and I get so blessed to see my granddaughter, six years old, just playing and doing these nonsensical things. And I get so much pleasure out of just being with her and watching her. And as I was doing that, I was thinking, you know, sometimes I get to thinking that God, unless I'm adding new television stations, unless I'm casting out demons, unless I'm seeing blind eyes open, unless I'm studying the Word and praying and tearing down strongholds and doing something that God isn't pleased with me. You know what? I believe God just enjoys watching me do basically anything. He just enjoys hanging out with me. God just enjoys being with us. When I'm sitting out on my deck and looking at the sunrise and saying, awesome, thank you, Jesus. Listening to the birds and doing stuff. You know what? God's pleased with that. And there's not very many of us that just hang out with the Lord and that just get to know Him. And I'm telling you, God longs for that. That's what He created us for, was for fellowship with Him. That's the purpose of salvation. Not just so that He could keep you from going to hell, but so that He could come to know you. God longs to know you. Isn't that amazing that God Almighty longs to know you? Just think if the President of the United States or somebody super important was calling you every day, saying, could I meet with you? I really would like to just go out to eat with you. Could we spend some time together? You know what? You could probably empty your calendar. You could probably find time. And yet here's God Almighty wanting to meet with us, and we go days and weeks and months without spending time with Him. And God's not saying these things through me to scold you. It's not a condemning thing. It's God saying, I love you. I want to know you. I'm praying that this weekend, instead of you coming and wanting me to share my knowledge with you, I pray that you would go directly to God and get to know God. That you would have an encounter with the Lord. That God would open up your heart and that you would come to know Him. Amen? That's what we need. We need to know God. And, you know, I feel really inadequate to try and get across what I'm saying to you. But I'm telling you that this is what changed my life. I was born again when I was eight years old. I knew things about God. I could quote Scripture. I was living a holy life. I was straight as a gun barrel and twice as empty. And then on March the 23rd, 1968, 
I had an encounter with God. And I mean, I came to know God. Now, I, it's a progression. Here's Paul in, in uh, Philippians chapter 3 saying that I might know him. And he had been serving the Lord for decades. He wrote half of the Bible. And he's still wanting to know him. So I'm not saying that I've arrived. I, I'm not saying, I'm still learning. There's still things I'm saying, God, I want to know you. But you know what? I came to know God in an intimate, close, personal way. March the 23rd, 1968. Ten years after I was born again. And my life has changed dramatically. And I'm just saying, I know that that's what a lot of people are missing. They just don't know God. And that's what God wants. He wants to reveal Himself to you. God wants to reveal Himself. He's not hiding He's speaking to you loud and clear. But you got to get this attitude that you seek with all of your heart. And then you're going to find. you got to get to a place where it's not something to say, All right, God, I'll give you ten minutes before my next show comes on. And if you can touch my life and reveal yourself to me and change my life, you got ten minutes. Go. <laughs> you know what? You're going to have to get to where you seek God. And there may have to be some... A period of time that you go through some frustration before you really get focused and stuff, but it's well worth the effort. God wants to reveal Himself to you. God wants to know you. God wants to be your best friend. Christianity is different than any other religion. We've got a relationship, not a religion. And man, if you can't talk to God and have God talk back to you, if you can't feel His pleasure... If you don't feel like God is pleased with you, you don't know God. Somebody says, well, you don't know me. No, you don't know God because God's not dealing with you based on your actions. He's looking at you in the Spirit. God sees you differently than you see yourself. You need to get to know God. And the way you know Him is through the Word of God. Amen? So that's what all of this weekend is going to be about on my part is just trying to reveal how do you get to know God? And I tell you, I've got some really powerful things. Tomorrow night I'm going to share something that I think is going to revolutionize your life if you can come back, so make sure that you come. You know, before we go anywhere else, the first step in knowing God is that you have to know Him as your Savior. You have to, first of all, recognize you can't save yourself. It's not about being a good or a moral person. It's not going to church. It's not just reading the Bible, paying your tithes. You have to bow the knee and say, Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You have to accept salvation as a free gift. If you have never done that...